Well, good evening and welcome to the Society Library. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Sally Bedell Smith, the author of Elizabeth the Queen, The Life of a Modern Monarch, published by Random House. I'm Mark Bartlett, for those of you who don't know, the head librarian here at the Society Library. And I want to take one moment to give a special welcome to the members of the library's Goodhue Society who are here with us tonight. Any member of the library can join the Goodhue Bequest Society. If you are interested, just have a look in your program and there's information inside. We do thank the Goodhue members and everyone who supports the library from year to year, making evenings like tonight's program possible. The book Elizabeth the Queen brings to life one of the world's most fascinating and enigmatic individuals. Having grown up in the country of Canada, it would be no exaggeration for me to say that the Queen and the royal family have been a fixture in my consciousness for as long as I can really remember, and certainly a steadfast presence in the lives of my parents' generation. From the money that I carried around in my pocket with the image of Her Majesty on the front of the bill, and for those of you who haven't seen the $20 bill that was changed a few years back, do come up and look at it after. It's beautiful. Um, and my Aunt May uh, Bartlett's, uh, what I would kind of call her love, respect, and perhaps uh, a little obsession uh, with the royal family to uh, this lovely photo um, that I found today on the uh, internet of a visit of Her Majesty to my hometown of Fredericton. And of course, growing up in Canada, the ongoing debate that uh, was quite common in, in my day as a young man, uh, people talking about the Queen's place in the country. Did she belong anymore? Did she not? It was very much a part of all of our lives. We all knew of the Queen. For this book, Ms. Smith drew on numerous interviews and private documents to paint a really fascinating picture of the personal and professional life of Her Majesty. Writer Walter Isaacson wrote, In an era plagued by flawed public figures, the world's most famous woman has graced her realm impeccably for 60 years. She does so by being both mysterious and grounded. Sally Bedell Smith, through great reporting and insightful writing, provides a revealing look inside the palace to show how the Queen balances being both modern and traditional. Our celebrity-saturated world could learn a lot from her and from this book. Our event this evening will be recorded. We'll also have a short question and answer period. And our friends from the Corner Bookstore are out in the Peluso Family Exhibition Gallery, and they will certainly be happy to sell you a copy of the book, and I believe we'll be able to have autographs as well. So please join me now in a warm welcome to Sally Bedell-Smith. Oh, he did. Darn. <laughs> took the money away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark, for that very generous introduction. It's lovely to be here at the New York Society Library. Um, I left New York in 1991 to move to Washington, D.C., and before, uh, before I left, and actually for a few years after I lived in Washington, I, I was a member of the New York Society Library. I came here and um, did research for my first two books on Bill Paley and Pamela Harriman and loved wandering around in the stacks and being able to, to keep books for quite a while, actually. <laughs> I may have been one of the miscreants who uh, kept them for longer than I was supposed to. But anyway, uh, it's a beautiful place and, and a haven for, for writers. And, um, and it's just a, a real pleasure to be here tonight. As I've been traveling around the country talking about Queen Elizabeth, the one consistent question that I have heard is, what did you learn that surprised you? And um, the answer is that it really seemed like there was something unexpected around almost every corner. I obviously don't want to give away all the surprises that are in the book, 
but I thought I would share a number of the discoveries that I made about the way the queen goes about her work and about aspects of her character and personality that people don't really know about or fully appreciate. One of my main goals in writing Elizabeth the Queen was to part the curtain and tell what she's really like, taking the reader as close as possible to Elizabeth the human being, as a wife and a mother and a friend, as well as a highly respected world leader. I also wanted to do what none of her previous biographers, all of them English, had done, which was to explain her relationship with the United States and her connection, including 11 visits, five of them private holidays in Kentucky and Wyoming. The fact is, there is no one like the Queen, and she lives in her very own world. While the other heads of state have come and gone, Elizabeth is the longest serving world leader spanning the 20th and the 21st centuries. She is the second British monarch in a thousand years to celebrate a diamond jubilee marking 60 years on the throne, which is a milestone that she modestly observed on February 6th by visiting a school and a town hall near her home in Norfolk at Sandringham. The only other was her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who celebrated her Diamond Jubilee in 1897 when she was 78 years old. If Elizabeth, who turns 86 on April 21st, is still on the throne in September 2015, she will surpass Victoria's record of nearly 64 years on the throne. Between the two of them, Elizabeth and Victoria have been on the throne for 124 of the past 174 years. And they have symbolized Britain far longer than the men who were kings in between the two of them. <laughs> In this Diamond Jubilee year, I think it's worth emphasizing why the Queen is relevant in the 21st century. Several years ago, she was at one of her yearly garden parties at Buckingham Palace, making her way through a crowd of nearly 9,000 people and greeting a small selection of guests. She was asking them such questions as, have you come far? When one woman looked at the queen and said, what do you do? <laughs> well, <laughs> a few days later, she recounted the conversation to a group of friends at a birthday party. And she said, I had no idea what to say. It was the first time in all the years that she had been meeting and greeting people that anyone had ever asked her that question. As her biographer, I knew that I had to explain what she does. And it is an impressive range of duties. With the assistance of Buckingham Palace, I was able to observe her over the course of a year in many different settings. And I accumulated impressions that helped me understand how she carries out her role and how earnestly she does her job with great discipline and concentration in every situation. She most emphatically is not a figurehead. Every day, except Christmas and Easter, she spends several hours reading government documents such as classified intelligence reports, foreign office cables, budget documents, minutes of her prime minister's cabinet meetings, reports on the day's proceedings in parliament. These are delivered to her in battered red leather boxes that can only be opened by four keys. She reads them in the morning, and she reads them at night, and she reads them on weekends when she's out at Windsor Castle or when she's up at Sandringham or um, Balmoral in Scotland, and she even takes them with her when she visits her friends on weekends. Um, one of her friends told me about the time when 
the desk, when the queen was visiting and she was desk bound for an entire morning. Must you, ma'am? Her friend asked. And the queen replied, I'm afraid if I missed once, I'd never catch up again. It's hard to imagine all the information that the queen has accumulated over the course of six decades. And she has used it prudently in exercising her very specific right to be consulted, to encourage, and to warn when she meets with government officials as well as senior military officers, clergymen, diplomats, and judges who come to her for confidential private audiences. As she once said, the fact that there's nobody else there gives them a feeling that they can say whatever they like. The most important of these encounters have been the weekly audiences with her 12 prime ministers. Now, consider the trajectory. Her first prime minister, Winston Churchill, was born in the 19th century and served in the army of her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. To her current prime minister, David Cameron, who was born three years after the birth of her youngest child, Prince Edward. In fact, she got her first glimpse of her future 12th prime minister when he was eight years old and appearing in a school production with Edward of Toad of Toad Hall. You can only imagine what she might have said to David Cameron when he came in for his first audience in the May of 2010. Even the most skeptical of her prime ministers have quickly recognized that they have much to gain from these private audiences. Labor Prime Minister Harold Wilson was embarrassed during his first audience when he was unable to answer a series of probing questions from the Queen. He later admitted that he felt like an unprepared schoolboy. Like his predecessors and successors, he came to view his time with the Queen almost as a confessional where he could unburden himself um, about his political enemies and his concerns about various ministers in his cabinet. His political secretary told me that Wilson considered Elizabeth to be a highly intelligent raconteur of the political scene. One of Elizabeth's senior advisors told me that he was surprised how relaxed Margaret Thatcher was when she would join the Queen's courtiers for a glass of whiskey after her audience with the Queen, which seemed to him almost like a tranquilizer for the hard-charging Prime Minister. The Queen doesn't have executive power, but she does know how to use her unique influence. In her role as head of state, she represents her government officially at home and abroad, but she also serves as head of nation, which means that she connects with her people to reward their achievements and also to be in touch with their concerns. Two decades past the normal retirement age, she still does 400, some 400 engagements a year, traveling around the United Kingdom to visit cities as well as tiny hamlets. Charles Pohl, who served as private secretary to both Margaret Thatcher and John Major, told me that the Queen knows every inch of this country in a way that nobody else does. She spends so much time meeting people that she has an understanding of what other people's lives are like. She understands what the normal human condition is. She's also spent an extraordinary amount of time honoring citizens and members of the military for exemplary service to their country. In 60 years, she has conferred more than 400,000 honors and awards, and she has given them in person more than 600 times. People need pats on the back sometimes, she has said, it's a very dingy world otherwise. 
Mary Soames, the youngest daughter of Winston Churchill, told me that when Elizabeth was a 25-year-old brand new queen, her father had been impressed by her attentiveness that she always paid attention to whatever she was doing. Watching the queen make her way along the line of, a people, of people at one of her Buckingham Palace garden parties, I was struck by that quality and by her measured pace, which her Lord Chamberlain, who is the senior official at Buckingham Palace, told me she does very intentionally. She moves that slowly, slowly in order to absorb as much as she can. I also marveled at her mastery of brief but very focused conversations and her sturdy stance, a technique that she once explained to the wife of one of her foreign secretaries by hitching up her evening gown above her ankles and saying, one plants one's feet apart like this. Always keep them parallel. Make sure your weight is evenly distributed, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> the queen also has remarkable stamina. President George H.W. Bush said during her state visit in 1991 that she had left even the Secret Service agents panting. I witnessed this myself during a royal tour to Bermuda and Trinidad in 2009 when she was 83 years old and her program for, called for long days of meeting and greeting. One of her private secretaries once said that she has two great assets. First of all, she sleeps very well. And secondly, she's got very good legs. And she knows how to stand. And we all know how to stand too now. The queen, he said, is as tough as a yak. <laughs> I got another insight from a woman named Benedictine Valentiner. And she, for many years, oversaw Blair House in Washington, <clears throat> where the queen stayed during her 1991 visit. And she happened to see Elizabeth one morning before she set off on a half dozen engagements. And she recalled for me that the queen was standing by herself at the base of the staircase. It was as if she were looking inward, getting set, she said. This was how she wound up her batteries. There was no chit chat, but standing absolutely still and waiting, resting in herself. It was a remarkable coping mechanism. Elizabeth is usually surrounded by many people, but being queen does make her a solitary and singular figure. It is crucial for her to keep a delicate balance at all times. If she seems too mysterious and distant, she loses her bond with her subjects. And if she seems too much like everybody else, she loses her mystique. She doesn't carry a passport. She doesn't have a driver's license, although one of her cousins confessed to me that she drives like a bat out of hell on the private roads of her estates. She can't vote, she can't appear as a witness in court, and she can't change her faith from Anglican to Roman Catholic. And because of her hereditary position, everyone around her, including her family and her closest friends, must bow or curtsy when they greet her and when they say goodbye. Although she was raised by strict nannies who prevented her from being spoiled, she was also trained from childhood to accept this deference. A friend of mine recounted the time when then Princess Elizabeth came to, fam to, to visit his family at their estate in Scotland. He playfully threw her onto the sofa and his father, the second Earl of Airlie, then grabbed him by the arm, pulled him into another room, punched him in the stomach, and said, never do that to royalty. Well, my friend said that the princess didn't really mind, but that was the atmosphere in which she was brought up. Her friends tend to be women and men she has known since childhood and members of her large extended family along with a surprising number of Americans, including Will Farish, 
the former U.S. ambassador to Great Britain, and his wife, Sarah, as well, of the, as, well as one of the Queen's longest-serving ladies-in-waiting, Virginia Airely, who grew up in Manhattan and Newport. And yesterday when she gave an address, when the Queen gave an address to um, both Houses of Parliament in Westminster, uh, Westminster uh, Hall of Westminster, I was pleased to see in the procession there was the Queen, there was Prince Philip, and there was our American, Lady Airely, right behind her. A number of her friends spoke to me about what it is like to be the Queen's friend. And she is first and foremost a source of what one of her cousins described to me as, um, as uh, for sound, very human, very wise advice. Monty Roberts, who is a California horse whisperer and has been a friend of the Queen for more than two decades, once described to me the advice that she gave him before he demonstrated a controversial new technique for training horses to a highly skeptical group of British horse trainers. And the queen cautioned him, you need to ease up so you don't appear too competitive. As Monty later said to me, she has an incredible ability to read intention. She takes an interest in the lives of her friends and their families, but they are careful neither to burden her with their problems nor to venture beyond an invisible barrier. As one of her longtime friends told me, she is not someone who is enormously intimate. She is a wonderful friend, hugely amusing. She's straightforward and she's down to earth and she's thoughtful, but you can't go too close. There is an aura. It is not because she's doing it on purpose. It's just part of her. You cannot encroach on her personal life. You just don't go there. The one person who can penetrate that wall is her husband of 64 years, Prince Philip, who was actually a big surprise to me when I was doing the research for this book. He is crusty, and he's sometimes rude, <laughs> and he makes jokes that often fall flat. But he has been an unwavering support to the Queen. As her longtime senior advisor, Sir Martin Charteris, put it, Prince Philip is the only one in the world who treats the Queen simply as another human being. And of course, he added, it is not unknown for the Queen to tell Prince Philip to shut up. Because she is queen, that's not something she can easily say to anybody else. When I traveled with the queen, I got a real sense of how in sync uh, Philip and Elizabeth are, with a kind of expert choreography, like a sort of royal Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I also saw aspects of him that contradict his caricature, of brashness and insensitivity. He always watches the queen intently to see whether she needs any assistance. I once saw him bring a little child to greet her. He often spots people who are in a crowd and can't see her, and he will walk them out to a better vantage point. When the queen needs a boost, he's also there with a humorous aside, sometimes whispering in her ear, don't look so sad, sausage. Although Philip doesn't get involved with the Queen's government work, I learned how much she relies on him in her decision making. Her advisors told me that if they have a question that they bring to her, she always asks them to first find out what Philip thinks. Her approach to problems is to look at the big picture and ask for some other options while Philip drills down and gets to the heart of the matter. As one of her advisors said, he has a sort of defense staff rigor. He can pull an idea to bits, find the good parts and the parts that need work. I was also impressed by Philip's wide range of interests. He is quite a good artist. He makes jewelry. He's written a book on ornithology. And he was an early adapter to computer technology 
and once claimed to have petted the first microchip on the head. <laughs> While Philip and Elizabeth are not physically demonstrative, they have a deep connection. I also discovered that they are both very strong-minded, and the queen has sometimes gone to unusual lengths to avoid uh, confrontations with her husband. Tony Parnell, who was for 30 years the foreman of their home at Sandringham, told me about the time when Philip's dressing room needed to be repainted. On Her Majesty's instruction, he said, we had to match the dirty paintwork in order that he wouldn't notice. He said, I don't think he ever knew. Yet on the last night that I observed them in Trinidad, they were working in perfect harmony, greeting 65 guests who had been organized in seven groups at a garden party hosted by the British High Commissioner at his hilltop home. 88-year-old Prince Philip and 83-year-old Queen Elizabeth <clears throat> started at opposite ends of the garden, and they were supposed to have 4.5 minutes with each of the seven groups. They both spent more than the allotted time, but somehow, magically, they managed to meet exactly in the middle of the terrace. That night, I also witnessed at close range something I had heard about from several friends, and that is that the queen doesn't perspire, even in the hottest temperatures. Now, um, <clears throat> it was such a steamy evening that everybody was dripping from the heat. But after an hour of lively conversations, the queen walked past me, and there was absolutely no moisture on her face. One of her cousins, Pam Lady Pamela Hicks, who has traveled with her to the tropics on a number of occasions, explained to me in her inimitable way that the queen's skin does not run water. <laughs> and that while it may look good, it actually does make her uncomfortable. I actually, and I saw further evidence of this a year later on a July day at Ground Zero in Manhattan when the temperature hit 103. And one of the women who spoke to the queen said, we were pouring sweat, but she did not have a bead on her. I guess that's what it must be like to be royal. The queen's physical courage is another tra uh, trait that people don't really know much about. One of her horse trainers told me about the time that she was inspecting a group of yearlings in a field near his stable. And suddenly, six colts began rearing up and galloping all around, something they called dive bombing, while everybody else with the queen ran for the gates. But the queen stood her ground, as did her trainer. She knew that if she stayed still, the horses would settle, and she remained completely unruffled. Monty Roberts told me that she gets calmer in the face of problems rather than having an adrenaline panic. One of her good friends, John Julius Norwich, jokingly told me that he thought the secret of her serenity might be never having had to look for a parking place. <laughs> but the serious explanation may well lie in her religious faith. George Carey, the former 103rd Archbishop of Canterbury told me that she can take pretty much anything that the world throws at her. And one of her se former senior advisors went a bit further, saying she has no illusions about what can and can't be changed. She has an acceptance of the way of li life deals its cards that is rare in the Western world which is partly from her religion and partly from her life experience. But the biggest surprise for me was learning about her private side, the gaiety of spirit seen by those who know her well. In addition to my observations as a biographer, I was lucky to have three social encounters with the Queen at private gatherings. And each time I caught glimpses of the animated gestures and the sparkling blue eyes and the flashing smile that are 
familiar to her friends and her family, but rarely seen in public. On my first meeting, which was during a garden party at the British Ambassador's residence in Washington, D.C., I watched the Queen have a spirited conversation with my husband about the Kentucky Derby, which she had seen for the first time the previous weekend. And I was reminded of what British artist Howard Morgan told me many years earlier, after he had painted the Queen's portrait. Her private side took me totally by surprise, he said. She talks like an Italian. She waves her hands all around. Two years later, after I had been working on the Queen's biography for a year, I met her again at a reception at St. James's Palace in London, this time in honor of the Pilgrims, a group that promotes Anglo-American fellowship. When I mentioned to her that my daughter was marrying an Englishman in London, she said, when is the wedding? The 4th of July, I replied. Oh, she said, that's a little dangerous. Once again, I saw the smile and the twinkle. The third time was a month before the wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton. And again, we met in St. James's Palace at a party given by one of the Queen's cousins. I had been told that the Queen would be there that night, but I had not expected her to stay for a full 90 minutes, which is highly unusual. She was in great spirits, and the atmosphere at the reception was much more informal than it had, than it had been at the Pilgrims' Gathering, mainly because there were so many of her friends in the group, as, long as, as well as quite a few members of her extended family. And she was happily making her way through the, through the crowd without any, anybody running interference for her, anybody making introductions, and what struck me was that here she was in her own palace, but she was merely a guest, which to me was a measure of her appealing humility. And that humility was one of the most unlikely of my discoveries. Her cousin Margaret Rhodes explained to me that the queen can uphold her identity of herself as queen and still be humble. Her inner modesty stops her from getting spoiled. I found the roots of this humility in the way she was brought up. When she and Prince Philip were out on their first big world tour in 1953, when she was 27 and he was 32, they were every bit as glamorous a couple as Kate and William are today. And they attracted crowds of hundreds of thousands, just the way They've shown up for Kate and William. Yet Elizabeth's mother wrote her a letter reminding her to think of herself simply as the vehicle through which the love of country can be expressed. Somebody asked me what it was like to write about somebody who didn't have a dark side. And I replied in, that in the case of the Queen, what was more fascinating to me was that behind that regal and dignified image, there are humanizing traits that we can all relate to. In the company of her friends and family, the queen is also shrewd, tolerant, cozy, sensitive, lively, funny, compassionate, spontaneous, keenly observant, and even earthy. So I thought I would end by sharing a few of the many examples of these traits that I found. How about Cozy? Every Sunday after church, when she's at Windsor for the weekend, the queen drives her jaguar to visit her cousin Margaret Rhodes, who lives in a very modest cottage that the queen gave her many years ago on the grounds of Windsor Castle. And when the queen arrives, Margaret curtsies to her and hands her a gin and Dubonnet, and they proceed to sit in her drawing room and talk about friends and family. Well, as I sat on Margaret's sagging sofa in a room where the dog toys were strewn around on the floor, I could imagine the queen sitting in the very same spot, hat very firmly on her head, but thoroughly relaxed. 
Or how about the time that the American artist Frolic Weymouth was at Windsor painting a portrait of Prince Philip, and the Queen invited him to have lunch with the two of them in one of the private dining rooms at, at the castle. Not all, and, and Frolic walked in, and he was amazed that there were no butlers around to serve them their meal. Not only did the Queen insist on serving him from a buffet, she also insisted on clearing the table. She stacked the plates, Frolic said, which is what we were taught never to do when we were, when we were growing up. How about spontaneous? While driving a Scottish cleric on a tour of her Balmoral estate, she suddenly shouted, hooray, when she spotted one of her gamekeepers walking on the hills with a young woman. Why did you say that, ma'am, said the cleric. The queen then explained that his wife had left him, and she was absolutely delighted to see him out with a new girlfriend. <laughs> Sensitive, when Margaret Thatcher celebrated her 80th birthday at a party in 2005, she had become quite frail and, and also begun to show signs of dementia. As the queen approached, the former prime minister extended her hand, which the queen then held as Margaret Thatcher gave her one of her characteristically low curtsies. But then the queen did something quite unusual. She continued to hold Margaret Thatcher's hand and for the next 10 minutes tenderly guided her through the crowd of 650 people, which was a remarkable sight for the British who were unaccustomed to seeing the queen so physically demonstrative. Compassionate, when IRA terrorists killed Lord Louis Mountbatten, the queen's cousin and Philip's favorite uncle, along with several other members of their family. The Queen cared for Mountbatten's 14-year-old grandson, Timothy Natchbull, who had been severely injured in the attack and whose twin brother had been killed. When he was uh, released from the hospital, he arrived at Balmoral late in the evening with his sister, and the Queen served them soup and sandwiches and took them to their room and even started to unpack them until she was prevailed upon to go to bed. Timothy later talked to me about what he called her non-stoppable mothering. He told me that the queen had been caring and sensitive and intuitive and that she managed to get him talking about his traumatic experience in ways that other people had not been able to do. Funny, the queen has a very dry wit. In 2003, her American lady-in-waiting, Ginny Airely, celebrated her 70th birthday party, uh, birthday with a party at Annabelle's in London. And this was something that um, the queen was very eager to attend because she had not been to a nightclub since shortly after her marriage to Prince Philip in the late 1940s. That evening, she was seated next to Lord Salisbury, who was one of the most prominent aristocrats in England and a former head of the House of Lords. And she was in a great mood that night, telling jokes, laughing, having the time of her life. The next day, she had an event at St. Albans Abbey, north of London. And she was being introduced to dignitaries by the dean of the abbey, who spotted Robert Salisbury in the line and asked whether she knew him. Oh, yes, she said. Robert and I were out in a nightclub together last night till half past one. <laughs> While such private glimpses may surprise many people, Elizabeth's behavior as queen has always been reassuring and consistent and predictable. Her wise conduct and her role as a unifying force are more valued today than ever. Long admired and respected, she is now beloved. When she celebrated her golden jubilee 10 years ago, people realized that she was about stability, continuity, calm through adversity, and humor when things are going wrong. Suddenly, they got the point of the queen who had been doing her job for 50 years. 
Now that she has reached her 60-year milestone, she is bigger than politics or celebrity or fashion, and yet she has learned to move with the times, making sure that the monarchy is responsive without being trendy. Her ability to adapt to a changing world was all the more impressive to me because she grew up in an atmosphere that was almost Edwardian in character. Her lifelong friend and former top advisor, David Airlie, told me that he thought that she is the sheet anchor in the middle for people to hang on to in times of turbulence. People may disagree with the monarchy, but it is hard to dispute that her life has been dedicated to serving her people. Or as Tony Blair once said, she is the best of British. She lives by the values that we all aspire to have, which made her life story inspiring for me to write, and I hope readers are equally inspired. Thank you. Thank you. You have a you have a question. Yes. What did you think of the movie? Of the movie. The movie, the, movie, the Queen. Um, everybody, I talked to over two hundred people for this book, and I was interested. I asked everybody, and um, <clears throat> I guess the bottom line is that many people felt that Helen Mirren was very good at capturing um, aspects of the Queen's personality and character and things like the way she walked and the way she put on her glasses, um, various mannerisms. Um, Peter Morgan, who, I, who was the screenwriter, and I got to know him quite well, um, and I also uh, interviewed Helen Mirren, who came to tea, which was great fun. Um, uh, she, she, I mean, it, there was a lot of deep research that was done for that book, but of course Peter made up all, all the scenes and um, all the dialogue. But there, was, there were moments that rang particularly true. I don't know if you remember that time when she was driving her Range Rover fast, as I recall, <laughs> which was in character, and she hit a rock in a, in a, in a, in a creek or in, in some body of water, and she called her Gilly on the, on the phone, and she said, uh, I think I broke the prop shaft. Now, that was entirely believable because the Queen in 1945 spent a month working for the ATS, uh, the Auxiliary Territorial Service, and she learned everything there was to know about driving a truck, stripping down an engine, changing spark plugs. You know, she got down and dirty, and she learned a lot, of, and she learned to drive very well. She drove the two ton truck through London. Um, and there was another moment that also rang true when she said to Tony Blair, uh, it's Margaret who measures the depth of a curtsy, not me. And Margaret was, in fact, much more of a stickler for protocol. Um, so there were things like that that did resonate. Um, the, the, uh, Philip, as far as I know, has not called her cabbage, although he has called her sausage, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and and to me the and, and and the kind of ultimate conclusion that I that I came to is that is that 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 was that was a, a movie about really one of the worst weeks in her life the week after Diana died and and the portrayal of her, her was much more like her public persona um, she because of the tragic circumstances of the, of, of the week. In a way, she had to be for her family the way she normally is um, in public, so she didn't show much of that jolly private self that that she would normally be would normally be what people saw up at Balmoral. Um, <clears throat> she uh, she has not seen the movie. Um, Tony Blair actually told quite a funny story on himself, which was when um, he went to a, an audience not long after the movie came out. She said, I understand there's a film. I'm not going to see it. Are you? No, ma'am. Nope. <laughs> and, uh, and I talked to uh, one of her cousins who briefed her um, quite thoroughly on, on the film and, um, and said that, in, you know, although 
you know, it portrayed her in some uh, in some respects as being sort of chilly and removed. Um, in the end, it it did show really the essential truth about why she reacted the way she did that week, which was to protect her grand grandsons, who is who had lost their mother in a you know a terribly catastrophic accident, and. Um, and and the queen sort of acknowledged that this was this was the case that it probably and in in, and I think it did benefit the monarchy and did benefit the queen. There was a great rush in Balmoral chic. Lots of people were running out and buying barbers afterwards. Um, but overall, it, it, I think it was good for her. But Monty Roberts told me that he was talking to her afterwards about the movie, and he said, "Well, you know, you really should see it. I think it's." I think it's good for the monarchy, and it's good for you. And she said, well, I think that depends on your point of view. <laughs> and, and his takeaway from that was that he, she wanted him to know her as he knew her, not as Helen Mirren portrayed her. Um, and in many people's minds, the two have gotten sort of conflated. Um, but it was, a, it was a good move. She saw the king's speech, by the way. She was reluctant to see that at first. And then when it got all the Academy Awards and also the way people responded to the King's Speech, which was, I don't know your experience, but everybody gave it a standing ovation in the theater that I went to, and I think that was a pretty common reaction. So she did see it, and Margaret Rhodes, her cousin, talked to her about it, and she didn't get overly enthusiastic about it, but she thought it was quite a good movie, and I think her approval was evident um, just a few months ago when she gave an, an award to... Um, um, who played the, the, not Colin Firth, no, um, oh, you know, help, what? No, no, the, the one who played the Queen Mother, ah, uh, Helena Bonham Carter, she gave her, she gave her an, um, um, an OBE, and, um, there's a very sweet photograph of the two of them, of her curtsying to the, to the Queen, um, so she did like that. I mean, she was apprehensive about seeing her parents portrayed, but she felt that it was a very good movie and, and quite accurate, I think. Anyway, that was way more than you wanted, but, yeah. I wonder what sort of relationship did you have with Buckingham Palace during the writing? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I, I started the book in, um, in, in February of, of 2008, and I immediately wrote a very exceedingly polite letter to the um, to the Queen's press secretary and got an equally polite letter back from her saying we get requests like this all the time and we just can't honor these requests and you know good luck <laughs> basically but I was lucky having um, written a book about Diana Princess of Wales that was published back in 1999 and I had quite a few good sources from that book who were willing to help me once again. The general sense that I got from people um, in the palace was they felt that it was a very fair book to the royal family and to Charles in particular. And so not only did the people who helped me with the Diana book offer to help me again, not only by giving me information, but by introducing me to more people, and there was a group of about six of them who served as my advocates. And they went to the Queen's senior advisors and said, look, this is going to be a serious book. It's going to be a fair book. Yes, she's an American, but, um, but, I, have, but I have spent you know, the last three decades um, spending a lot of time over there. I um, have a, um, 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 an, an appreciation for and admiration for British institutions and the monarchy, and um, and so uh, they briefed the queen, and she gave them the green light. And what that meant for me was that um, I was able to travel with the queen both in the UK and overseas. I was able to see her in all these different settings. They did open doors to some people for me, and um, and when people would call up and say, I've been contacted by this writer and what should I do and they'd say we are working with her so we have no objection so that was enormously important and there were no strings attached to it by the way I didn't you know I was not an authorized biographer which means you have to submit the manuscript for approval which will only happen by the way after the queen dies yeah I, I mean, I, they don't typically 
do that, but I have been in touch with um, one of the senior officials who was very helpful to me, and I'm going over to London in a couple of weeks, and I'm having lunch with her, so I figure that's a good sign. Um, I had sent her a copy, and I had also sent a signed copy for the Queen. The Queen typically does not read books about herself. Um, she, as one of her senior advisors said, she's probably the least self-absorbed person you'll ever meet. You know, she doesn't like to talk about herself. I mean, she she it's not she keeps track of the press coverage, the general uh, reactions to the royal family because she must. But she she doesn't really like to do that. Um, wait. Way in the back. Could you make any comments about the Queen's relations with her children? There's a lot in the book about that, and um, uh, it's sort of hard to summarize, but um, <clears throat> I think if there was one criticism of her um, over the years, it, it was that she was perhaps a, a, a detached mother, um, particularly with her first two children. Um, my feeling is that was mitigated to some extent by the circumstances of her becoming queen at such an early age when she had a three-year-old and an 18-month-old. She, she knew she would be queen from the time she was 10 and her father became king when Edward VIII abdicated, but she did not expect it would happen that early. And you have to remember what life was like in 1952. Um, Everybody around her, it was an entirely male world. All of the courtiers were male. Everybody in government was male. And she really felt a responsibility to, pro to prove her worthiness uh, um, as, as, as a sovereign. Um, I had an interesting conversation with, with Gay Charteris, who was the widow of Martin Charteris, who I mentioned in my remarks, who was very close to her and... Um, and served her for almost three decades. And she said, you know, uh, it was probably easier for her to go back to her boxes than it was to deal with temper tantrums. And she, of course, had some very good nannies, one in particular, Mabel Anderson, who was very nurturing to um, Prince Charles especially, and her mother, the Queen Mother, who was a very devoted grandmother and, of course, Particularly in those early years, the Queen and Prince Philip would go off for six months at a time. And so the Queen Mother was there to be, um, you know, a more nurturing presence. But I think um, that detachment probably had the most adverse effect on Charles, uh, less so on um, Anne, who is, is a pretty tough character. <laughs> and uh, and then, when, then there was a 10-year gap. Um, and then she had Andrew and Edward, and the feeling was that perhaps to compensate, she was a little bit more indulgent um, with those those other the the, the subsequent um, um, sort of group of children, those two. But um, she certainly has been an incredibly attentive grandmother, um, particularly with with William and um, Harry. Um, one advantage that they had that Charles did not have. Charles was sent to the northernmost part of Scotland, to Gordonston Academy, Gordonston School, rather, which was where Philip had gone. Philip is a sort of alpha male guy, and he thrived at Gordonston. Charles, much more delicate flower, he was bullied and miserable at Gordonston. Both William and Harry went to uh, Eton, which is right down the hill, from Windsor Castle, they frequently went up there to have tea with her, and she has taken a real interest in them. Um, I thought the, one of the most fascinating things she did, insofar as kind of giving those two boys particularly good guidance, is um, three years ago she personally recruited and appointed Sir David Manning, who was um, the British ambassador to the United States and is also, it was a very experienced um, a diplomat, very wise man, and she recruited him to be the mentor, really, to those two young men, and now to Kate. And if you look closely at pictures of Harry's trip to the Caribbean or William and Kate's trip to Canada last year, you'll see David in the background. And uh, he's been giving them very good advice, and she made sure that that was going to happen. 
Oh, it went up here, and then, yeah. Um, well, I do, and um, she is in this job for life. Uh, even before she became queen, uh, she gave a very touching um, speech on her 21st birthday when she was in, in South Africa, and she, she pledged that whether her life be long or short, it would be devoted to the service of her people. But the most important um, moment that ensured that dedication was at the coronation. And I always thought, the coronation, you get a crown. Um, and that's the big deal. The big deal at the coronation is the anointment with holy oil on your forehead and your chest and your hands. And that, what, and that accompanied a, a sacred oath to be the representative of her people, and to serve her people. And she took that extremely seriously. She's reiterated it over the years. She did yesterday. She did back on um, the 6th of February when she marked her actual accession. And uh, it is something that she's absolutely committed to. When George Carey was retiring as Archbishop of Canterbury, he came to her and told, told her that he was, he was going to step down, and she said, you know, that's something I can never do. I'm going to carry on to the very end. Now, Margaret Rhodes did tell me that they once talked about this, and um, the Queen, there was only one circumstance that could sort of change that equation, and she, the Queen said, if I were to get Alzheimer's, or if I were to be incap incapacitated by a stroke, um, I, would, I would step aside, but I wouldn't step down. Uh, she would not retire. What would happen is the Regency Act would kick in, and Charles would become the Prince Regent, much as the future George IV did when um, George III went nuts with Porphyria. And um, so that's the one circumstance where Charles could sort of take over uh, in a temporary fashion until he became king. And skipping the generations is, I mean, there are public opinion polls that say people would love to see William and Kate the next king and queen, but there's no mechanism for it. Charles would have to take the throne and then abdicate. Is there one, another question? Somewhere, yeah. Well, I deal with it in the book. Um, you know, the rumors have been there for a long time. He certainly has, an, ha, has always had an eye for pretty ladies and um, is, is somewhat flirtatious, but I could find um, no evidence, and I think you have to have evidence um, that can be corroborated. Um, and there are uh, several of the women who were linked to him have denied it, so I went with what I had basically. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have books for sale once again, and Ms. Smith will be here at the front of the room. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>